You're listening to the Straits of Video Podcast with Rob Lane. All right, all right, what's going on? And thank you so much for choosing to listen to my show, Straight to Video. Today, I chat with Mr. Richard Backus, who checks in with me from his home in Raleigh, North Carolina. Richard is the guitarist for the band Degeneration, a rock and roll band that exploded out of New York City in the mid 1990s. Not conforming to any musical genre of the time, Degen forged their own path with gritty, aggressive, infectious, and unapologetic rock and roll anthems, which to this day sound huge. Of course, I didn't find out about Degen until way after their time when our band Teenage Casket Company came together almost 10 years later. Our mix of pop metal meets punk rock opened up doors to me as I was exposed to new bands from the other members of TCC. Our guitarist Jamie Delerick was a huge Degen fan and introduced us all to their magic. We even covered one of their songs on our second CD and along with Steve Brown's 40 Foot Ringo, Degeneration would become the joint blueprint for our style. Not everyone will get it, but those who did were on board 100%. A few years later, Jamie and I got the opportunity to play alongside Richard as the UK factor of his band The Luckiest Girls, and it was a treat to perform all over the UK, proper DIY style, playing Richard's songs along with some DJ and classics. And then later in 2011, I would get the chance to see the reformed D-Generation play their one-off UK reunion show at the sadly now-closed Borderline in London. And to this day, it remains one of my all-time favourite shows. Now, Richard's story and journey is like no other. Being born in the UK, his family would move to the West Indies when he was just a young boy and then eventually settle in the USA. From there, he would experience and come into contact with so many characters in the music industry and New York underground that it paints an almost unbelievable story. One that should certainly be put into a book, but as Richard explains, books and autobiographies are supposed to be believable. No one would believe his, it's that crazy. He shares his time rubbing shoulders with the Ramones, Boy George, White Zombie, the list is endless and always unpredictable. We talk of the early formation of D-Gen, touring with Kiss and Richard's departure from the band before they would reunite many years later. It's quite the ride and I'm sure there's hours of stuff we didn't even touch on. Now whilst I've got you, I want to shout out to the newest supporters of the Straight to Video Patreon page. Thanks to Ian Scott and Aaron Del Bono for signing up to support and champion this show. Really means a lot to have you both on board. If you want to check out patreon.com forward slash stvpod, you can find out about all the cool backstage perks that are available, which really help grow this show, including bonus episodes, behind the scenes content, early info on guests, and even some exclusive merchandise. And also, grab yourself a great 15% discount from our friends Dead Skull Coffee, who produce some fine ground or full bean coffee with their independent rock and roll coffee company. Simply log on to deadskullcoffee.co.uk and add the promo code STV on checkout. Super easy. All right, let's check in with Richard Backus. Richard has a brand new album just released titled Viva La Wattage, which is available now and you can pick it up from sueguitars.com. That's S-I-O-U-X guitars.com. And you can reach out to Richard on Twitter at Luckiest Backus or on Instagram at Dubnacious. We did this chat in two parts, so you'll hear the first half is recorded outside in the sunshine on Richard's porch in Raleigh, North Carolina. So the chat is accompanied by a few birds singing and motorcycles revving in the background, which I hope doesn't distract too much. But the stories and events you're about to hear will more than make up for it as we listen to my straight-to-video chat with Richard Backus.
Hey, uh, how you doing? I'm good, mate. Look at you representing. Yeah, I woke up this morning. I was like, I need to find a snazzy cowboy shirt. And then went in the bathroom and saw. I was like, oh, wait. How's everything been? You keeping all right? Yeah, keeping great. Raleigh, North Carolina. It's been really soggy the last few days. We've been having some really weird weather coming off the Gulf of Mexico, but it's been pretty great. Nice. It looks lovely, man. It looks lovely. Loving it down here. Yeah, this is, uh, this is my porch. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent stuff. <laughs> I was release day yesterday. I think it went pretty well. Really solid response. It's been fun having some feedback. You know, it's like, you know, you know how it is when you're making stuff and you're just sort of like yelling in a hole. And then, mm -hmm. and I've been sitting on this stuff. It's a recording I did a little while ago. Just, it's really nice to have feedback. People are, seem pretty excited about it. I want to get into talking about your new album, but I want to give people listening kind of some history in your journey through growing up and maybe the early days of degeneration if possible because what i think is interesting obviously you live work and perform in the u.s but you're originally from the uk and did you even live in the west indies as a kid yeah born in england and then uh my dad was from saint vincent in the grenadines he kind of had it in his head that he'd live in the uk for 15 years and then go back home which is like a real common thing among caribbean people they sort of build themselves up and they go back home and bring whatever they picked up in the rest of the world back to the islands and try and make something there and uh it was a really poorly planned trip my dad was one of those people that you know you can relate and i can relate i think everyone can relate to someone being from somewhere like i've got to get out of here saint vincent is tiny current population is 100,000 people and uh, there wasn't much for him to do there except grow bananas so my dad stowed away on a cruise ship wow. when he was 14 got to England got picked up by the you know the authorities parents came picked him up brought him back he'd had a kid so they brought his son brought him back to, to uh, St. Vincent and then he immediately just jumped on another ship and took off again and went back to England and then met my mom. And uh, yeah, he's a, he was an exceptional character. <laughs> Where was your mom living? My mom was from London. They're funny characters, not necessarily the greatest parents, but they were, they definitely had some imagination. So how long was you in the UK for? I lived there until I was seven, lived in a, a little town called Hockliffe, just outside of Dunstable near Leighton Buzzard. Just tiny dairy village and there were these council houses there. We lived there till I was seven. And then my dad packed everything we had, including like a washing machine, all these electronic appliances, put them all in a van, put them on a boat, shipped them to St. Vincent. And we ended up in this like shack that my grandfather had built that was up in the mountains with no electricity. There was running water, but no hot water, uh, no stove. So we were cooking on open fire and growing bananas. And How was that for you? That must have been a massive culture shock. At seven years old, when you're yeah. like a kid and like just into having fun. and I mean, luckily I'd been to Cub Scouts, so <laughs> <laughs> it was just like advanced Cub Scouts. You know, we're hungry. What's for dinner? We're like, oh, that chicken looks tasty, you know. Like, Crazy. So when did the USA come into the whole picture? Like I say, it was really poor planning on my parents. They basically turned to uh, alcohol and just, they were drinking the strong rum down there. And my mom ended up in the hospital. She got so bad with it. My dad basically checked out and the authorities had to stay step in and take care of us kids put us at this halfway house this holding house with like a bunch of people from sweden that they'd arrested for piracy because <laughs> they got down their boat and guns were illegal and they just had this massive armory of weapons on their boat <laughs> and they were these really cool people from sweden that like turned me on to like donna summer and like all kinds of music and stuff <laughs> And uh, when my parent, my mom eventually got out of the hospital, I had family in America that stepped in and gave my dad a job. He was an auto mechanic. That's what he'd done in, when he was in England. So they brought him up to New York to work in a shop. So how old would you have been then when you came to the USA? Nine. Man, you were getting things like cultural things just bombarded with you. Yeah, yeah. It's it's really, you know, it's, it, you know, people always say to me, that was like, you, know, you really should write a book. And I'm like, there's no point in writing a book because books have to be believable. My story is just ridiculous. It's just completely insane. I mean, I get to New York, bum around in New York for a bit, go through middle school, and then get into high school. And I meet the English teacher in my school was like the house photographer at the limelight. Like, nice, he didn't want to go into work. He, I was 14. He'd just give me a camera and be like, hey, can you go do this? I'm doing paparazzi work, taking pictures of like Brooke Shields and stuff. <laughs> so then I met like a whole bunch of other insane people. And that's how I, you know, got to be friends with like, I met Alan Vega from Suicide when I was like 14. <laughs> and he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, there with like a Pentax camera every Saturday night, hanging out with like Boy George and Billy Idol. <laughs> 
It was so twisted and funny, you know, like doing that and then going back to school on Monday, you know. How did they feel when there's just like this like young teenager turning up? Well, I had a ton of makeup on and was fairly like gender fluid, like androgynous. So they didn't really know what I was and they couldn't tell how old, you know, you couldn't tell how old. It's really funny because like I always tell people, like people don't realize that New York was like a candy land. It was, it was a safe space. You put on some eyeliner and you tease your hair out. You can go anywhere and be safe and be comfortable. And people would look after you. You know, I got babysat by, you know, really cool people. That's kind of like a punk rock ethic. It's always had like a real good community vibe to it. Everyone watches out for everybody. Yeah, yeah. So you got to America when you was nine. Did you settle in fairly easily? No, it was really hard. It was not coming directly from England. I think coming directly from England would have been. But I'd spent like four years, like literally living in the rainforest with like no electricity, no TV, no input. I mean, we'd get bits and pieces of culture. Um, the radio there was like, you know, playing Calypso and reggae and stuff. I mean, not even reggae, it was really just Calypso and soca. I remember when we were living in that pirate house, like my uncle Denzel, who's like, I'm really close with, sent us Led Zeppelin two, and we listened to it. And one of the only books we had was The Lord of the Rings. So we're listening to it and we're like, what is this? This is awful. Like, this, this is terrible. Like, you can't dance to this. But then we heard, oh, The Darkest Steps of Mordor. We're like, oh, we're reading that. We've read that eight times this year. So we taped over Led Zeppelin 2 with all Donna Summer <laughs> and then left that. And so it'd be like, this is a dark, in the darkest steps of Mordor. Then oh, I love to love you, baby. <laughs> <laughs> So what was the music that initially attracted you then? Was it once you got to America, you, you started gravitating towards certain things? It's so funny because like in England, like my next door neighbors were Teddy Boys and I was fascinated by them in, in, in Hotcliffe. I mean, I, to this day, I don't understand like where they came from, but my best friend lived next door and his dad was a Teddy Boy. And this is in 1977 and he's, you know, he's got a like, pink drape coat and pink stripy socks. And I was like, man, that's cool. Like, I remember just being obsessed with that whole thing. They had a cortina with fins, like a 60s one. And, and that really j- jumped out at me, you know, culturally. I remember my mom had a reel to reel that she had like Pink Floyd's I'm a Gummer on. And I was really into that. And I remember watching Top of the Pops and seeing the sweet and being really obsessed with the sweet. I mean, the 70s Top of the Pops, man, it's going to get you. Yeah, Gary Glitter, the sweet. The vaguely remember being like really young, the TV was on and there's a clip about the Sex Pistols. And I remember just being like, oh what is that that's terrible and i went in to the kitchen and i was like mom there's this guy on the telly he's just swearing i don't understand it's horrible and she was like what did you kind of see um connections to that once you got to new york in the punk kind of scene which was happening over there or did it take a while for that to kind of filter in i got to new york and i ended up in middle school and i'm there was this kid Guido Papa that everyone used to pick on. I had an English accent, so everybody would, you know, I'd get smacked and they're like, say something, say anything, you know, say butter, dude. And I'm like, butter. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, ah! He's like, and it was just, there's another kid, Guido, who had terrible skin, just a real quiet, cool kid. I was drawn to him and his, his mom was like, barely spoke English. They were Italian, firstborn generation Italians. Actually, they'd lived in Australia for a while, but... But his older brother, John, had a, an electric guitar set up in the basement of his house, and he was really into metal. He was really, I mean, he turned me on to Accept, and he was, he was super into Black Sabbath and stuff. And Guido was really into the Beatles, so we would, like, listen to, back in the day, there was a Beatles show where they just play, like, 10 Beatles tracks every week. And so we couldn't buy the records, but he'd tape them off the radio with, like, a, holding a tape deck in front of the stereo. And we were just super into music, and then... John had a guitar, you know, it was like this really crappy Tysco that, and he was like, here, you can have this. So I started playing rudimentary chords and then someone, somehow we ended up with a drum set and we were all fighting because we all wanted to play drums because that seemed to us at the time the easiest thing to pick up. We made Guido play drums and we'd play Twisted Sister covers in the basement because they were really easy. And then we figured out that Twisted Sister songs are just ripoffs of Sex Pistols songs <laughs> and we started playing Sex Pistols songs. When did that click for you then? Because you'd seen Sex Pistols on TV, but you weren't really into it. But then later on, did it all suddenly make sense? And you're like, oh no, this is cool. When I went to high school, there was an art program where you could study painting at Cooper Union. It's like a really pretty prestigious art school in Manhattan. They had a Saturday program where on the weekends you could do life drawing and then also painting from life with like a life model. I got my sister into it, me and my sister. So we, and it was right, Cooper Union is right on St. Mark's Place in New York. So we didn't tell our parents that we got let out of three. 
we'd go early in the morning, just had to spend the whole day on St. Mark's Place, just walking up and down. And then there were all those characters. You'd see people, you know, you'd see the Ramones walking around and you'd see all kinds of, you know. Attracting you into the whole scene of it. Yeah, there was a, there was a clothing store in the corner there that it was called The Late Show where um, Frenchie that used to hang out with the New York Dolls, he kind of ran it. And you could buy a coat for $2. So we'd go in there and we'd buy weird clothes. And, and there was a shop across the road called Revenge that sold records and clothes. And you could buy like, you know, skinny ties with the jam on them. So I started buying records and bringing them home. And you could buy a record for two, you know, used records for $2. So I bought the Saints, I remember, the Pistols. And that's when I started really getting into punk music. And then the same guy that was sending me to the limelight, he had a really good record collection too, and turned me on to television, yeah, Jane County and stuff like that. How long was you doing the whole photography thing at the limelight for? How long did that last? Maybe like a, a year or two. That must have been exciting. It was, yeah, it was it was crazy. It was just nuts. One of the greatest things was like hanging out with Boy George. Like he was the, I mean, he still is the funniest person, you know. And he it was like at the time, he was like brand new and people just didn't know what to make of this like androgynous, like that was just some of the greatest times ever hanging out with him. But he became like the biggest pop star on the planet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would that be around the time when it kind of hit the pop? or was it kind of just before it, Culture Club broke? Well, it was right when Culture Club was huge, you know, and so sharing the same atmosphere as that, it was just, and he was so funny and approachable. It was so cool. Did he have like a big entourage of people around him? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. He, he had a, a bunch of lunatics with him. <laughs> Helen Terry was like his right-hand person, the backup singer. And yeah, she was beyond her. Just so amazing. But it was funny too, because it, it just made me comfortable though around people. To this day, I mean, I, I don't really, really get starstruck because you just realize that everyone's cool, you know, generally. I mean, occasionally there's a, a, there's a, someone who's a real jerk, but you know that too. I mean, you've met so many of your heroes yeah. and it's just like, it's fun to like interact. I think a lot of the time, the ones which have got the longevity are the coolest ones. You don't stick around for that long and being a dick. I think some people manage right, it because right. they are so rich and famous, but most of them realize that you got to treat people well to stick around and see it out for the long run yeah yeah so how did you get involved with was it steve lewins um he was in several bands chelsea and with wilco johnson and yeah i, I dropped out of school and basically homeless in new york went into this shoe shop uh, i was like yeah you know i need a job and they were like okay how old are you and i was like oh, i'm 21 you know and i was i was like 16 at the time so they were like, all right. And I worked there a couple of days. They're like, oh, yeah, you're really good at this. I was, you know, this young, androgynous, weird kid. The shoe shop, it was on 8th Street. So it was like a fashionable shoe shop. But then they also had this line of like thigh-high leather boots. And so the drag queens would come in. And the guys that owned the place were like Israeli. So they were really pretty homophobic and really not comfortable around these people. And I was like this, you know, 16-year-old kid hanging out the limelight. And I was just like, I just wouldn't bat an eyelash and treated them like whatever they wanted to be, you know, like whoever. And they loved it. And so they would come in and I'd let them try on every boot in the house, you know, and they wouldn't buy anything. But then people started saying, and then eventually someone would come around and buy something. And the guys were like, yeah, you, you've got this. You're the manager. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm the manager. At 16. <laughs> Steve came in one day. He's like, can I fill out an application? And I was like, he's English. And me being English, I was like, oh, no. I was like, another English person to pick on, you know? <laughs> Steve came in, worked one day. The next day, he came in before early before his shift. I'm like, What's, what are you doing here? You know, you don't, you're not supposed to work it. not supposed to be it until like three. And he's like, it's okay if I just go and crash out in the back. I didn't really know anything about drugs. Or, you know, I mean, like hard drugs. <laughs> he basically went and shut up and fucking nodded out in the back of the shop. I don't think he ever really ever came back to work, but he just continued to do that. And then he was like, why aren't you in a band? And I'm like, I always wanted to be in a band, but I don't do anything. So so I need a guitar player. You should play guitar. And so he, we went up to 48th Street. We bought a guitar and he showed me how to play a power chord. Did that for a couple of days. Like, all right, now. We, so we've got rehearsal. He takes me up to the music building and he's had a band called The Fugitives. So I come in. His band's there. It's his drummer, Billy Cardinal. Guitar player, Gene Casey. He played bass and sang. And so I'm like, okay, so what do I do? And Gene's like, all right, well, this way it starts in A. And you can tell he's already annoyed. And he's like, all right, the first, it's an A to D. And I'm just like... He's like, you don't know where A is, do you? I'm like, no. And he just storms off and Steve's like, no, 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 you, you can figure it out. And then we went and played CBGBs like two days later. <laughs> what? <laughs> what do you think it was that he saw in you? 
he'd obviously had a history of like playing and touring and it brought him to the USA. What was it that he saw in you? Well, that was the thing. I was just kind of glammy and wearing eye makeup and lipstick and stuff and just being a weird goth kid, you know, on East, East and West State Street. But that's like a proper trial of fire going into the gig straight away. You must have been terrified or did you love it? That was the thing. And, I, and I've kind of kept this thing going. It's like, I just let it happen. You know, good things have always come to me. If you just let it happen, it happens. When you start trying to fight stuff and I'd see people trying to make things happen. And that was a lot of, you know, some of the issues I ended up getting into with Degeneration is like, if they were so structured and I was like, oh, structure, yuck. <laughs> you went on the road with me. You know how, how I roll. <laughs> <laughs> Just let things roll, man. Go with it. Nice and easy. I love it. So how long were you playing with the Fugitives for? We tried to make it for three years. And the Fugitives was really cool, too, because, like, Steve's girlfriend at the time, Cindy Pack, she was the bar manager at CBGB's. So we had, like, full roam. I got to go to CBGB's for free. I saw everything and anything that was happened there in, like, 85, 86. Basically lived there and drank for free. Steve got the job of uh, being the, uh, the light guy there. I mean, Steve was such a character. I mean, one of the biggest junkies I've ever met, but would just maintain and just so funny. I mean, he was old school. William Burroughs old school. And then after that, wasn't you in a band called Demolition Boy? Like, I mean, it was all just like trying to cobble stuff together. Like after I left at the shoe shop, like, I think I brought Steve in and Steve may or may not have robbed the place. Oh, shit. So they fired me. They were like, no more English people working here. So I went next door to the this place called the record factory across the street from there was butterfly it was this clothing store that danny nordahl was the manager of so like we would go way 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 back so then i got a job at caroline records as a shipping guy and we were shipping like every single amazing record it was around 1986 87 and the manager <laughs> this is nuts so the manager of caroline records the guy that managed the warehouse is nikki garrett from the uk subs so Nicky had just made a record, a UK subs record. Belvy originally was from Seven Seconds, but he played drums on the UK subs record. And so Nicky brought him in to work in the warehouse. Belvy was useless, but Belvy walked in like, you know, tear all teased up. And I was like, oh, he's cool. And he had Demolition Boy. I can't remember what guitar it was, but it was this giant hollow body Japanese knockoff. And Bowie was like, man, that's a cool guitar. Like, you should be in my band. And I was like, all right. And I played maybe two or three shows with them. But one show that really stuck out was we played L'Amour opening for Jane's Addiction. And it was so funny because, like, we were in the dressing room and, and I had, like, a green top hat and white monkey boots on. And my girlfriend at the time was a knitwear designer. So she had all these crazy neon colored, like, button down Mr. Rogers sweaters and matching kind of skinny pants. So I had this, like, head to toe like purple neon Mr. Rogers sweater with a, like a t-shirt underneath it and then green hat and monkey boots and Perry Farrell was like wow where do you get your clothes <laughs> and like and I think the next next like video I saw he had like on a green hat and I was like oh okay <laughs> <laughs> we know where he got that inspiration from it's so funny because it, it's really funny because his whole family was there is like Perry's originally from Queens yeah that was a really fun night before I'd worked at Carol, I knew that. So I, I'm hanging out at the Chelsea Hotel. I met Bridget West at the Chelsea. I said, someone should write, I should write a book. I mean, I probably should like map this stuff all out because it's all like, it all happened really quick. There was this German lady, a woman called Schizo, her and her boyfriend, Umberto Menzinger. They were living at the Chelsea and they'd come over from Germany. They had all this money. Like Umberto was like a count. And they just had bucket loads of money and they just decided he wanted to make his girlfriend a rock star. She was like in her late 40s, like early 50s. They moved into the Chelsea because they thought that was the place to be. And everyone got word that like, there was this, le this woman that had all this money that would pay you to play music with her. And I showed up there and had, I was like this, this homeless kid. And I just like, kind of moved into their room at the Chelsea. They had like a loft bed above the door that they didn't even know existed. And I was like, hey, man, there's like a bed up here. Like, it's cool if I crash for a minute and then kind of weaseled my way in there. And I would sit and they had a little Fostec studio. And I, I wrote like a ton of songs for them, like maybe 10 songs. And like she had lyrics and stuff. And I helped her like make this whole body of work. And Umberto would just keep like feeding me coffee. and <laughs> But yeah, so that's was playing with those guys. And then that, hanging out with them, there was a woman, Valley Myers, who uh, was like a muse of Salvador Dali. There's a film about her called The Witch of Positano. She lives in Positano, Italy. She was just this crazy, literally crazy woman that had like done trepanning where she'd made a hole in her skull and exposed her brain, like filmed a video of it. And she had a mustache tattooed on her face, like a Dali mustache. She'd hang out and we'd drink like a Lebanese Rocky and she would tattoo people, like hand tattoo.
tattoo people and it was just this crazy boho and all these weird characters would come through and I'd be hanging out there with Shizu and Umberto and, and one day Bridget showed up with her husband and her husband is this amazing painter, John Valenzuano, I think his name is. He actually did a bunch of artwork. He did, he did some album covers and stuff. It's really neat stuff. But yeah, and so and it was really funny. So me and Bridget, I don't know, man, like as soon as we met, it was like we clicked. We just hit it off right away. We just started talking. We were into the same shit and just same ideas about music. And I ran into her a couple of weeks later at another party that they were having. And she's like, yeah, my husband kicked me out. I was like, why? He goes, he says, well, he saw the relationship that you and I struck up in like a minute and just got super uncomfortable. And he doesn't, you know, he, he's like, you, he says, I should be with you. And I was like, uh, I don't even fucking know you. Like, what the hell? Well, how about we just start a band then? And we started playing. I went over to our house and writing songs there. And then one thing to another, we did kind of hook up and stuff. And then uh, when I was working at Caroline, someone, I guess someone, and this is before cell phones, somehow she'd got wind that I was working at Caroline. So they're like, I had a telephone call and, I, and she's like, hey, you know, I'm, uh, I've got a band with Didi from the Ramones and I want you to come and play guitar. And like, and I was like, hung up. I was like, all right guys, you know, <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> Walked off the job. Went up the road to up to Didi's, actually it was Didi's apartment on East 10th Street. And Didi was down in South America. And she's like, I'm like, what's going on? She's like, yeah, well, you know, I'm kind of dating Didi Ramon now. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. You know, Didi's awesome. Then we ended up hooking up again, even though she was with Didi. And then Didi came back from South America and he had a horrible time. He just didn't like playing South America. It's like down in Brazil and they throw like fireworks and stuff on the stage. It was super stressful for him. And he was a mess. He was, he was on massive amounts of lithium. He was like all blown up. He gained like 20 pounds. He just looked like garbage. It was like, so he comes back and he didn't really know that her and I were a thing, but me and him hit it off and we started writing together. And he had this giant bag from a clothing store on 14th Street that was called D&D &D Clothing. And it was just this giant sharp bit. It said DD on the outlet and it was full of notebooks. And I was like, well, let's write something. He goes, well, I don't know. And he's like, I've got this bag of lyrics, you know. And it was all stuff that he'd submitted to the remote. It was everything he'd ever written was in this bag of these notebooks. He was like, I don't know. I mean, he, you know, he wrote a lot of stuff and presented a lot of stuff to the Ramones. And, and now it's well known that they were a hugely dysfunctional bunch. Like writing for him was a, a, a struggle. He was not comfortable doing it. So I just dove into this bag of notebooks and pulled out and I saw the title Poison Heart and I was like, wow, Poison Heart, like that just fucking says something. That's great. And then I just started writing this like kind of just two chord thing and, and I wrote a melody and then we threw it on a tape. We collaborated on it and then he took the tape over to Daniel Ray's house and he came back and he's like, oh shit, like where's the tape? The tape's missing. And next thing I know, like that was property of the Ramones and Daniel Ray had taken writing credit for it. <laughs> Holy shit, I never knew that. That's insane. Was that the band called Sprocket? That was Sprocket. And yeah, we'd, we'd seen this Saturday Night Live sketch. And like I say, it was like one of those things where we're like, fuck it, well, let's be Sprocket. Now's the time on Sprockets when we dance. And our drummer at the time, Stephen Stereo, he did these great t shirts. I, and uh, yeah, it just kind of stuck. We played the first show and it was at the, uh, the Rap Art Center in the Lower East Side. And Joey gave us our first show. Joey Ramone had put on, was putting on the show for CMJ and he gave us our first show. It was opening for the Cycle Slots, the Cycle Slots from Hell. So me and Didi, we'd written this set with Bridget and it was really fun. Didi was really enjoying playing. Like he never, like he never jammed. He's like, man, what are we, what are we jamming? Like we, we played down on the street by the Stooges, like for like eight hours straight, just hanging out. The Ramones was very, you know, regimented and you know, we were kind of more grungy. And he, t he was getting more into his bass sound. Like with the Ramones, it was like everything on 10. They just dimed everything that was on the stage and just blah. And he was getting more into like a nuanced sound and a tone. And he was just having a really good time. So we played the show at the Rap Arts Center. We sound checked and kind of got our sound. And then right before we played, after we sound checked, Bubbles, who was stage managing the show, Bubbles was the roadie for the Ramones, came out and just basically did what he did at every Ramones show and just made sure that the SVT was cranked on 10 all the way up. Oh, man. After we'd sound check. So, of course, we come out and we start playing and the bass is just way over everything else and it sounds terrible. We got off stage and people were like, what the fuck was that? So Didi got it in his head that Joey had sabotaged him and was just convinced because we only had five songs or something like that. So it was a really, really short set. We didn't really have time to figure out what was going on. We just kind of like that. And Didi stormed out. And then the next day, I'm sitting on the bed next to Didi. And that was it. He, that was when he quit the Ramones. Shit. And it was just so crazy. It was just like... So you was there when he quit the Ramones? Yeah. Man. 
You definitely need to write a book, dude. <laughs> the next day they found CJ, though. And so I guess there was somewhere in the works that they, they kind of saw it coming. Then he found out that CJ was like gone AWOL from the Marines. He was like, oh man, that's so cool. And he was in just in love with the idea of CJ. It was like really funny. But then so our next show was at the Ritz opening up for the Pixies. It was the Happy Mondays, us and the Pixies. Of course, like the day before the show, Dee Dee quits. So I got my friend Toad, Mark Zadroga, went on to be in Viva the Wattage. We called him up, we're like, look, we need a bass player. And he's like, all right, well, when are we going to rehearse? I'm like, uh, we don't really have time. The show's, the show's tonight, <laughs> August 4th, 1987. <laughs> yeah, we got on stage and Bridget came out on stage. She's wearing these cowboy boots, immediately just wipes out, falls flat on her ass. I remember playing the first chord and looking over at Mark and like he had no idea and he's just kind of flailing away on the bass and I just remember dancing over to his side of the stage and just pulling the, unplugging his bass. But it was basically me and Bridget with the drummer kind of just sitting behind the drum kit. We got through like the four or five songs we had and the next day it got reviewed in uh, the Daily News and luckily they got the order mixed up so they thought we were the Happy Mondays. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the Happy Mondays was Dee Dee's new band. They didn't know that Dee Dee wasn't in the band. So the review was great. It was like, oh, the, you know, Dee Dee's new band is amazing. The Happy Mondays is shit. <laughs> And so did that band evolve into Viva La Wattage? Yeah, they did. We got our friend Mark Zadroga played bass. We had that show with the Pixies and Happy Mondays. He didn't play that night, but he did go on to end up playing with us. Did the sound change or anything? Or was it like a continuation in a way? It was a continuation. Bridget and I were the main writers in that. We sort of had like this kind of grungy kind of hippie thing going on. Obviously the name Viva La Wattage, it ties in with your new album, which shares the same name. And you performed the song The Luckiest Girl, which was written with you and Bridget right right yeah so it, that's the back of my amp that's the album cover and it's it was from back then and I had that stenciled on the back of the amp and I also had it stenciled on the back of a leather jacket so that's been there all these years that name yes yeah, right right where did that come from Bridget came up with it she was mar married to this guy Mark Penuelas so she had some she was always going kind of going back and forth in Spanglish and uh, just it's just a funny thing we just yell out you know nice one where did the song The Luckiest Girl come from do you remember The Luckiest Girls would, would I think it might have been the very first thing I wrote with Bridget. She just started writing the lyrics and then I kind of, I had the music and then, you know, patched up some of the words and stuff. It was the moment that her and I really clicked when we, you know, we were romantically involved and it was just like, it was a really special thing. The New York Loose recorded it in G and I changed it when I did it. I dropped it down to A. So it's got like more of like a Johnny Thunders kind of thing going on with it now. Yeah. So did that band kind of run its course and that kind of led into you joining D-Generation or was there much of a time span between those? Viva the Wattage, we kind of kicked around. We became really good friends with White Zombie and we played with them a lot. They used to play at the Pyramid. How was it seeing those for the first time? They just met Michael Argo and were starting to be the beginnings of their record deal and becoming what they were because they were kind of like a noise thing. They came out of like more of like the Swans and like Live Skull kind of end of things. And then they became more of like this like cartoony rock and roll thing, which Rob, you know, Rob and Sean, are like that was, that was their whole thing. They were like more for the illustration thing. And they liked us because we kind of had a, a goofy kind of thing. I had purple hair at the time and was wearing like old Dago and Bridget was dressing up like a, she looked like she was a aerobics instructor you know we were just playing around we were like really into CNC music factory at the time so we wanted to look like that it was getting into the 90s where pretty much anything goes right yeah it was it right and you know bicycle shorts and yeah Mike Patton was doing all kinds of crazy stuff so we played a lot with um White Zombie and they were doing well the way that that started was like I got a job writing for High Times magazine and it was like oh we should interview these, these guys they've got dreads and it it's funny because like Rob is like at the time was like the most straight edge person I'd ever met. I mean, not even really straight edge. He just didn't do any drugs. So he's just like, you know, so why does High Times want to talk to us? I'm like, well, you guys have got dreads, you know. So it's I think it's kind of funny, you know. But we, we became really good friends with them and played with them. And so we met Jesse because Jesse was the man with Van. And Jesse saw what was going on with us and saw that we were kind of savvy. And then when the opportunity for him to start his band, well, we had actually we were doing these green door parties where we would DJ and me and Howie were good friends from doing DJing at that. I've heard something about that. What is the Green Door? Yeah, the Green Door was a building on 24th Street that had a Green Door and it was owned by Giorgio Gomelski. Giorgio Gomelski produced Gong Records, he managed Magma, produced the first Yardbirds album, basically put the Rolling Stones together. He had a club in London in the early 60s called the Crawdaddy Club and basically like took Brian Jones under his wing and was like, you should get these guys to play with you. And really this amazing, crazy old Russian guy. And he had this building on 24th Street with a Green Door that he 
used to run all kinds of different things out of. It was a rehearsal studio for a bunch of bands. It was also an S and M club called Paddles. And then we, at our you know being super creative, came in there and did a party called the Green Door. And uh, it was just basically it was us playing like soul records, but playing the other side of the soul record. You know, it's like so it's like Aretha Franklin, James Brown, but then it would go into Stooges and whatever we felt like doing. And it was this hugely popular thing that we'd go until like nine o'clock in the morning the next day. But all the the bands were like, you know, why don't you have bands? I mean, like, we don't want to have bands. Bands are a downer. Bands are a pain. You're like, we just want to have a party. We want to have fun. And if there is going to be a band, it's not going to be your band. And then eventually, just somehow, we ended up starting a band because it just all this energy was coming about. And we did the first Degeneration show there. I'm not even sure we were planning on really doing it. It was just like kind of a one off thing. But then it clicked and we started enjoying it. And we started getting attention from people in the city. Was there an instant energy at that first gig where you're like, shit, this feels pretty good? <laughs> yeah, it, 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 was. it was. It was It was really cool. We, I mean, it's funny because the first show, it was like, it, yeah, it wasn't fully formed and we didn't have all the things. It was like a little bit more glammy in some places and more silly in places. And then we, we firmed it up. When, after that i know danny in particular he wasn't a fan of the term glam punk which kind of got associated with you guys but <laughs> i can see why people gravitated to that term you guys had like a great style and some fairly big hair at the time which certainly yeah, right. in the mid 90s that wasn't in vogue but i guess your stuff was perhaps more in line to more of a throwback pre-hollywood with more like the new york dolls than anything specifically sunset strip you just wanted to look good basically yeah i mean it was funny because like i just remember like all those guys with this any anytime anyone came up with anything to say and of course people can't feel super excited and they'd be like oh no no we're not that and i'm like oh just let it go like yeah how did you find it generating a buzz around that time in new york was you a contrast to everything that was surrounding you back then i think that's what it was it's just we were just we were just doing our own thing and we you know, we looked cool it wasn't like you know we weren't trying to look like farmers and that's what everyone else was looking like it was just everyone was like wearing like you know, these like cut off overalls and this, this skate thing and we were you know kind of being a bit smart and stylish I mean, it's funny because Mark Jacobs used to hang out at the Green Door and Anna Sui and all these different designers and they kind of picked up on it too. And we were really good friends with Stephen Sprouse. When we, we did Paper Magazine, we were on the cover of that. We modeled a bunch of his stuff. Yeah, was, I think people really picked up on it. It was a hard time when everyone was buying used clothes. It was like fashion people picked up. It was like, oh, these guys have got some snap and style to them. How easy was it to find a bill of bands that work for you guys? Was you at on your own? I think every band did it. Like I remember reading like, you know, I mean, the Martin Rev told me about how the dolls would always have suicide open up for them because they just knew that it was just going to be a complete contrast and everyone was going to hate suicide. I think that's the Van Halen logic as well. They always used to tour with like the most random bands. Right, right. But we always wanted to bring up bands that... So we would always have like the Lunar Chicks were a big one. We would always have the Lunar Chicks and Voluptuous Horror of Karen Black was another one. And so it was cool. It was always like female bands. So that was a lot of fun too because, you know, we played a lot with the gender fluidity with ourselves as well. Was it EMI you signed with? Because some sources actually mentioned Chrysalis. Was they one and the same? Chrysalis was owned by EMI at the time. So it was Chrysalis was the label that got us in the very beginning. This guy, Daniel Glass, who was the founder of Casablanca Records. Uh, yeah, he's a really cool guy. And and as soon as we got signed, he left the label. It's the age-old story, right? Yeah, and then the new people that came in wanted nothing to do with anything that the previous people had brought in. That happened so many times. It's unbelievable. Yeah. I, I guess it was also the, you know, it was the, the beginning of the end of the music industry, so it was happening more often than not. Weren't you able to turn the whole situation on its head through which eventually led into a bidding war with other labels and you found a new home with Columbia. Yeah, we ended. We had a, a guy from Columbia. He kind of just threw himself at it and he had some muscle at Columbia and had, we had, there were a lot of people helping too. Josh Chuse was very helpful. He was over at Sony working for them and he's the guy who did the artwork on both records and shot the videos for the first album. So yeah, he was a huge champion for us and helped us a lot as well. Was you enjoying it at that time or was it always kind of rocky with like the label situation? and stuff the label stuff at that time it wasn't really such a big deal and it was just we'd gone in and made the first record we were kind of glad to have a chance to have another full-fledged swing at it well i mean i, I don't know if we'd if we'd had our choice 
it would have been really nice to have marketed that first record properly. And it's funny, I've been going back and listening to it and I really like it. But at the time, it was just like, we didn't even get a chance to even enjoy that. We had to immediately get another record made and out. We didn't have material for a whole new record. So we had to, we went back and re-recorded No Way Out, which we all believed in as being a huge hit single, you know. And then you'd obviously head out on tour with Social Distortion, The Ramones. You did some stuff with The Ramones, right? Yeah, we did a bunch of stuff with The Ramones. We did a lot with Social Distortion. We did a lot with L7. Yeah, then we did the dates with Kiss that were just... It was really funny because the label was really gung-ho on us doing that. And we were just like, yeah, you know, I mean, I guess that tour was just bizarre. Any notable meetings with Gene or Paul? Oh, yeah. No, they were great. They were really, really funny. Uh, yeah, the first day of the tour, Jerry Nolan had just passed away. So we went in and talked to Peter Chris and we were like, hey, yeah, you know, we were friends with Jerry. And he just kind of shut down. I was like, oh, well, maybe that was a mistake. So we didn't really have much interaction with him after that. We went in to go say hey to Ace and the handlers were like, yeah, you know, you can you can wave at him, but no direct interaction. No, you know, we're not letting Ace speak to a band called D-Generation. Like, you know, that can't end well. So he wasn't allowed to hang out with us. And then we were in Toronto. We've been on the tour, a few dates on the tour. I wake up and we're in this, inside the, uh, the Sky Dome. It's just like the Death Star. It's so huge. You couldn't tell if you were indoors or outdoors. It was so big. All of a sudden, Darth Vader storms on the bus. It's Gene. And it's our first interaction with him. And he's like, hey, guys. So, you know, really enjoying you guys. I hope you guys are having a good time. We're like, yeah, yeah, this is fantastic. And Michael is in the corner, nervously on his practice pad, like brr, 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 playing paradiddles. And Gene's talking to us. And then Gene turns and just glares at Michael and goes, yeah, that's not at all annoying. Grabs a drumstick from him and just puts it on the bridge of his nose here. And it stands out perfectly still. And he stands there for like 30, 40 seconds. And then Taylor goes, yeah, you should learn how to do that. And hands Michael the drumstick. How random. And we're just like, what just happened? Like, I mean, it was just, it was the creepiest thing. I'm, he's standing perfectly still just with this drumstick. And he's in platforms. He's in the full getup. He's in the whole outfit. And it's like three o'clock in the afternoon. I mean, I don't know. Like, I didn't know he put the stuff on that early. So, of course, the rest of the tour, like, Michael's, like, got the stick on his nose. And he's just like, <laughs> like... <laughs> So good. So like during the time off from DGEN and you eventually reunited, I mean, crikey, it's probably over 10 years ago now. Had you all crossed paths over the time before you got back together? We stayed in touch. You know, we all lived in the same neighborhood and hung out at the same bars and stuff. And I mean, I left the band. I, I just left the band because I, I wasn't happy. I wasn't having fun. And it wasn't because anything in particular bad had happened. You know, no one had like been mean to me or anything. And there was no hard feelings, really, for, at least on my part. And then when they did ask me to come back, there was no hesitation. I was like, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll, you know, if you guys are still trying to do this, I don't want to prevent you from achieving what you you want to achieve and I'll, I'll come in and help out you know yeah it was, it was a lot of fun that was re really fun having to learn some of the stuff of through the darkness and just i'd kind of become a different person and really figured out why what i wasn't enjoying from degeneration those those poor guys were still all wrapped up in the thick of it so i just came along and it's like comedy relief so like over the years, you've seen many sides of the music industry. Like you said, probably one of the last bands to see the huge record deals and be around during the somewhat breakdown of the industry. How do you approach performing and recording these days? Do you enjoy the grassroots DIY level? Or like you said earlier, you just kind of let things happen and what happens, happens really. I like that it's become democratic and I love like the idea of Billie Eilish like sitting in her bedroom and making a, a hit record. And I think that's the way it, it will be. And I think it's just super cool. It'd be, I mean, it'd be amazing if you could have gone back to all those people in the 60s that what they would have come up with. They'd have had access to you know, someone like Neil Young. Yeah, it'd be really cool. Bringing things into present day, you've still got your band Luckiest Girls and that's what's billed as the new album, Viva La Wattage. Is it a combination of older and newer material? Everything has been, you know, the, a lot of the, some of the stuff is brand new. But yeah, it, it's, it's stuff, some of the stuff's been not around in my head for 30 years you know so it's finally got it out on vinyl as well right yeah that, that's what's so so cool about it yeah is that, uh, my friend ryan myers at sue records just called me up and was like yeah if, you know i want to press some vinyl you got anything and i was like as a matter of fact i have like a whole finished record sitting here waiting to go well richard thank you ever so much mate i'm glad we got to tie it all in yeah no and I'm, it's always great to hang out with you and miss you i'll have to get you back over with some luckiest girl stuff at some point yeah, for sure. All right, Rob. Well, thank you so much, man.
Thanks to the brilliant Richard Backers for sharing such an unbelievable ride with me here on the podcast. Please check out his brand new album, Viva La Wattage, which is streaming on all major music platforms and physical copies can be picked up from SueGuitars.com. If you could, please spare me a couple of minutes to check out and consider supporting the show over at patreon.com forward slash stvpod. Or if you want to dive into older episodes, they can all be found for free at stvpod.com. Every little good vibe you send my way with messages, comments, likes and shares mean the world and knock me down every time, so thank you. The next couple of chats which are already recorded are pretty cool if I don't say so myself, so please check back in with me in a couple of days and I can't wait to talk to you all again soon. Soon.